Every day, your City of Tempe staff goes above and beyond to make sure our community gets the best possible services and the most for our tax dollars. But how good is good? How do you measure it? And how do we know what we really need to make progress on some of our most pressing issues? To guide us, we developed a series of goals designed to help us improve our community based on our Tempe City Council's five strategic priorities. Reaching for excellence, we are comparing ourselves against the rest of the nation as well as ourselves. Some of our goals will help save lives. Some of them will help us save money. All of them will help us make Tempe a better place. Tempe Accelerates is an opportunity for you to get involved. Hear what city staff and community partners are doing to reach our goals. Your role? You are a vital part of our community. Share your ideas and help us craft better solutions. Ask questions. Be part of the conversation either in person or online. Check tempe.gov slash tempeaccelerates for dates and times of our next programs and collaborate with us at Tempe City Hall. Today, we will hyper-focus on two performance measures. Each presenting team will have 10 minutes to share data, strategies, and progress on a performance measure. Then, you will have about 10 minutes to ask questions or offer suggestions and ideas. On the back of your agenda, we have resource questions to help you participate in the conversation. Also included with your agenda is a quick survey with space you can use to include any ideas or suggestions you might have about today's topics. Thank you for participating. Now, let's accelerate. Ken Jones, Deputy City Manager. Welcome to our latest edition of Tempe Accelerates. And our lead-in video described it very well, but today we'll focus on uh, two performance measures that our staff uh, has sponsored, that will sponsor, and those sponsors of those performance measures will tell you how that performance measure came to be developed, where we are in succeeding in achieving that performance measure, and then maybe ask for your input on how you might suggest we accelerate and get closer to that performance measure in a shorter period of time. Um, Craig Fredericks from the fire department is going to going to present our first performance measure and that is uh, ALS or advanced life support response time okay all right so we get credit for the size of the audience so we invited half the fire department down here today so so we could pump up the numbers a little bit um, <clears throat> thanks Ken um, so my name is Craig Fredericks, as Ken mentioned, Assistant Chief of Emergency Services at uh, Fire Medical Rescue. And, and we are here to talk about our performance measure, which has to do with safe and secure communities. I jumped too quick on that. Safe and secure communities. And our performance measure is specifically to achieve total response times to advanced life support calls in six minutes or less, 90% of the time. Um, so, oh, let me back up just a minute because I think there's a piece of there I need to explain, advanced life support calls. So, so we, we split our medical calls up into two broad categories, uh, basic life support calls and advanced life support calls. Basic life support calls are those types of calls that um, are, have, a, have a, uh, a lower emergent nature, nature. They're not necessarily life-threatening in nature. Think about things like orthopedic injuries, most broken bones, dislocated joints, some sudden illnesses that come on, but, but the symptoms don't rise to the level of being life-threatening in nature. The other category what we're talking about today is those advanced life support calls. They require a higher level of, of, of medical care um, in the field from paramedics versus, versus EMTs. Those are things like strokes, heart attacks, cardiac arrest, diabetic emergencies, uh, drug overdoses, severe car acc accidents, those types of things. There's about 85 different ways to dispatch a, um, a advanced life support call. Medical calls at, at, all together make up about 85 80 to 85 percent of the uh, the total emergent calls for service that we run out of all of our calls medical calls that make up 85 percent of it um, and out of the, that 85 percent about 57 percent of those are advanced life support calls uh, so that's why we chose it as one of our more critical calls and it does make up a large bulk of, of the calls that that we use or that we go on excuse me um, so where's the six minutes come from it comes from a couple of different places the national fire protection association is, is, a, is a group that creates standards for fire departments, standards of all kinds for fire departments. That is one of, that is one of the standards that they've created in one of their documents, getting to advanced life support calls in six minutes or less. Uh, it's also part of our accreditation. And accreditation process, is, is, as a lot of you know in here, is that once every five years, 
look and evaluation at everything we do in our department. Um, and, and within the, that accreditation document, it is one of our, it is one of our goals to meet uh, six minutes, 90% of the time in, in the ALS calls. So that's why six minutes specifically, but it doesn't really tell us why it matters. So the reason the six minutes matters has to do with, with physiology, and I'm not gonna jump back into the college class, so um, no, no exam after this, but, and, and Aaron will be happy because he says I get too technical, and I won't get too technical. But really what I'm talking about is, is, is the human body. We know how the human body reacts when, when certain things happen to it. So uh, in, in a very basic sense, you go out, you go through your normal day, most of us go through a normal day, and our body is kind of in a steady state the whole way through the day, right? We're not getting you know, better every day, we're not necessarily getting much worse every day. You're kind of in that steady state. When, when, you, when an, an advanced life support type of a thing happens to you, be it a stroke, a heart attack, one of those things we mentioned, that steady state stops being steady and that's a sudden negative event that's, that's occurring in your body. And you continue down that negative event until, until you receive some medical care. That's where we come in. The sooner we can get you medical care and, and stop that negative event and the, and, the, and, the, and the trajectory of that and start to give you uh, the medication and the treatment that you need, the quicker we can get it turned around, get you to definitive care at a hospital and the better your chances are for full recovery. So, um, all the tissues in the body, they react to a lack of oxygen uh, differently. Um, that's why the American Heart Association has a thing called the chain of survival concept. This has to do with, with the cardiac um, issues that, that, that could occur, a heart attack. Think about in, in, in terms of a heart attack, uh, the medical textbooks use the term time is muscle. And what, what they're saying by that is, is the longer the, that, that a part of your body goes without oxygen, the more of that you're gonna lose. In this case, if we're talking about a heart, a heart attack, which is a localized event in your heart, I'm not talking about when your heart stops, that's cardiac arrest, but there's an area of your heart that's no longer getting the, the blood and the oxygen that it needs. Uh, you have about 20 minutes, we know this, before death of that part of the heart starts to occur and you start to lose that cardiac muscle permanently. That's why they have the chain of survival concept that includes us paramedics arriving on scene in time to to assess what's going on, start treatment with, within those eight minutes. Um, they have a, a thing called the chain of uh, recovery concept, and that has to do with strokes. Like I said, different tissues in the body, they have the ability to withstand lack of oxygen at different rates. You think about a stroke, a localized event in your brain, um, within about four to six minutes of a lack of oxygen, you're gonna start to have permanent brain damage in that area. Within six to 10 minutes, um, you're, you're, you're very likely to have that type of brain damage. So. That's where those things come from. The best way I think I can really illustrate for you why the six minutes is when we start talking about cardiac arrest. So this is a picture of a well-coordinated heart, all right? This, this heart is working well together. All the chambers are working like they should work together. They're taking in blood into the heart and they're pumping it out into the system. Um, you can see this is, this is basically a picture of, of the electrical activity of the heart. You can see the peaks are all at about the same height. The, the low points are all at about the same point on the chart. There's space in between them. It looks smooth, it looks rhythmic. That's what a good looking heart looks like. When you enter cardiac arrest, this is what the electrical activity of your heart starts to look like. I got this picture from a program called CPR University out of the University of Arizona, which is something that we, uh, we, we were a part of. And um, you would enter, your, your heart would look like this. If you enter cardiac arrest on the left side, that's about a 13 minute time span. On that left side, you can see that the peaks are, not, are no longer at the same height. The, the, the low points are no longer all at the same. They're all they're, they're at different heights. There's no space in between. What's basically happening to your heart right there is, is it still has electrical activity, but it's not pumping any blood. Um, the good news is if we can shock your heart in that far left rhythm, you've got about a 90% chance of bringing you back. Um, this is our response times, and it has the components written up in the response times, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, this is where we're trying to come in at six minutes. That is still a very savable rhythm. Um, if we can get in there in that time, if, if CPR can be started or CCR can be started, we can extend those, those rhythms on that left-hand side. We have more time to work, and we still have a, a, a decent chance of, of, uh, of bringing you back out of cardiac arrest. So for every minute that you go along that timeline uh, at the bottom picture there, um, your chances of survival drop by about 7%. So if we can get there in six minutes, we've got a very good chance of bringing you back. Um, so kind of to sum it up, why the, matter measures is because, why the measure matters is because um, we have a much better chance of giving you a full recovery if we get there soon and we start that medical intervention and start turning you back around the other way so you can start healing and getting better. 
so this is where we're at right now. This is our current measurement. You can find this on the dashboard on our website, uh, on the city's website. We're meeting six, six minutes, about 76, a little more than 76% of the time. That's a, that's a bar graph, reads from, from uh, it goes back to 2012. This did not become a performance measure for us until 2016, but we did want to get a better picture of where we've been historically as we're starting to look at where we're going to go. So that's why it goes back that far. You can see it's been pretty steady that, that time. If you, if you drop off 2012, which was a little bit lower, every one of those years is within a percent and a half of each other. So at 76%, that means we've got to drop about 14 more, 14% 14 of our ALS calls down below that 90, that 90, that uh, six minute mark to hit, to hit the 90th percentile. <clears throat> so, um, one of the challenges that, that we face when we're trying to keep our, our response times down is, is increased call volume. This is, this is a graph that was taken from a study that was done for us in, in 2017. It's a follow-up study to the station location study that we did in 2014. Um, and and um, in the, the 24, and based, what it shows is, is about a 4% increase in call volume each year. And we can go back and, and we've looked at as far back as we can see with previous station location studies done by, by our department. And, and you can see a 4% increase approximately every year for the last 30 years. And, and so we do expect it to continue. On that left side, the dark blue line, that is, that, that is the actual growth of the calls from, I think it's 2009-10, those are fiscal years, um, up until 2014. Um, the light blue line is the projection that, that we received from the, uh, from the company that did the study for us, ORH. That's their projection of where we were going to be. And the red dots are where we actually ended up being in those three years when we've, got, when we've received the, uh, the updated study from them. So you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's held pretty steady. We expect it to continue. Um, and the challenge with, with, with call volume increasing is that um, is, is, is as, our, as our units are busier and busier on calls, uh, when the unit is busy on a call, it means it's less likely to be ready to run another call that happens in the area. So if that happens and you have to bring in a, a unit from further away, that increases your response times. That's just one of the, that's just the challenge that we face with that. Um, so the, co the components of a response time and, and, and our current efforts to try to, to, try to attack the, the challenges we have there. We break, it, we break the front response time down into different components um, so that we, uh, we have a better chance of, of making progress on them. Call processing time is, uh, is the time between the time that, that 911 is picked up at the dispatch center and, and, and the truck is, di is dispatched at the station. So in that amount of time, call takers answering the phone, getting the information, asking the questions, putting the information in the computer, pulling up what needs to go and to, so we have the right resources on, on this call, and then, and then the truck gets, gets dispatched. Turnout time is, is a time that occurs between the dispatch at the station and the time that, that the crew presses the button saying that they're getting ready, that they're leaving the station. So that time that they're moving towards the truck, putting on any protective equipment they need to put on, and then the truck moving out of the station. And travel time is, is from that time, when the truck leaves the station until it, uh, until it arrives on scene and the truck stops. It's not, which doesn't necessarily mean we've made contact with a patient yet. If you think about a large apartment complex, something like that, when the truck stops, there's still time for us to get to the, uh, to the patient. So those are the components of of response time, and um, I said, as I said, we do attack them in different ways. One of the ways that we try to go after better call processing time, um, we are a part of a committee that consists of anybody within the 27 uh, departments in the valley that is dispatched by the Phoenix Dispatch Center. Any, any one of those cities can sit on the committee to talk about procedures and process and the latest in technology and what what type of things we need to have coming out of there to make that call processing time work right. We certainly are a part of that. One of the best things to come out of that group is, is a, a com computerized voice dispatching. So before we had this, and this started about in 2014, um, it was not unusual during busy times um, to have several calls in the queue waiting to be dispatched. You have multiple people at the alarm room taking in the calls and then as they're putting the information in, it goes to a single dispatcher. That single dispatcher then has to dispatch all those calls. So, um, like I said, not unusual to have several calls in the queue when, when, when we had busy times. During storm deployment, when things were really, uh, when we were really going strong, there were times we would have as many as 30 calls in the queue waiting to be dispatched. Now with computerized voice dispatch, um, as, soon as, that, as soon as that call moves forward, the lights come on on the station, they get a tone. They don't necessarily hear what it is yet, but they know in the station to start moving towards the truck and leaving. So that, that cuts several seconds off the call processing time. Turnout time is one of the things that um, our members, through their attitude, 
um, through through their, their their readiness has has the best chance of of, of affecting just just by making sure that, that, that they're always in a, in a ready state and, and, and we and we look at those things we, we try to affect those things through a few different ways starts out with training in the in the academies when we start to try to build that culture of of uh, being ready and, and understanding that uh, uh, the quickness of response to all different types of calls uh, we continue that training um, in probation uh, it, part of their probationary training is to learn all the street breaks and, and, and all of the roads in, in the city so that so that they know which way to go. They're not driving the truck yet, but it's gonna come down uh, in about a year to the point where they could be driving a truck on a call and we wanna get that culture going that they understand the importance of quick response. Um, in medical CE, several times a year, we, we have continuing education on, on, on medical calls and, and procedures and, and they get reinforcement on, on the importance of the timeliness of, of medical procedures and, and, uh, and um, applying um, drug doses. Um, at times, we, for reinforcement, we'll, we'll publish what the turnout times are. So all of, the, all of the units will know what their turnout time is. They know what the turnout time is for the truck on the other shift um, and, and everybody around them. It's, it works pretty well to reinforce the, um, the idea that it's important and plus kind of gets a little bit of a competitive spirit going, but that can also be a problem when you're pushing that button a little, too, little sooner than maybe you, you should be when you're leaving. Um, but uh, that's the human error piece of it. That's how we try to attack uh, turnout time. Also through, ooh, let me back up, station design. Everything in the station is designed to flow towards the bays. All the working areas, the living areas, it's all designed to flow towards the bays. And station design can have a big impact on our turnout times. If you think about the difference between a two-story station like we have at, at station six on Ash and, and a single-story station like we have at station one on Apache. Um, single-story station, everybody's flowing through the doors to get to the trucks. Two-story station, you've got to get from the second floor to the first. We use pole holes for that, which look like a lot of fun, I know. But um, also, if you have eight people heading towards the trucks, that can, you can get a little back up there, and you end up losing seconds in that. So station design can play a big role in, in our turnout time. So travel time, um, several ways we try to affect that. Um, strategically locating our stations throughout the city so that travel distances are shorter uh, and, and um, obviously affects travel time making sure that they're near intersections but not at intersections so that they have multiple ways to turn coming out of the station. Um, <clears throat> resource allocation, uh, or excuse me, resource location makes, makes a big difference. That station location study that um, we completed in, in 2014 showed us a few things very clearly. Um, three of our current stations are very near their ideal locations. If you wiped out of all, all of our stations, started again, our three newest stations are, are right where you would want them to be. We have two other stations that, that we consider to be in the very acceptable locations. And, um, and then it recommended stations in Northeast and Southeast Tempe. And we're currently working, as you guys know, on station seven in Southeast Tempe. And when that is completed, response times throughout the city, the 90th percentile citywide will drop by a few seconds. More importantly and more impressively, response times in Southeast in station seven's area uh, will, will drop by a minute and 23 seconds. So pretty good gain, uh, pretty good gain there. We also need to make sure we have the right assets deployed at the stations. Once again, thinking about two different stations, Station Four on Elliott is a single unit is a single unit station that we can we can reasonably expect to rely on that truck to be available to run the calls in that area. Um, if you try to do the same thing on our at our station on Apache, which is one of our busiest station with two units, and you only had one unit in there, that unit would be gone so often that we would be constantly pulling in trucks from other stations to try to cover that area, equaling longer response times. Once again. Um, one, of the, one of the best things we did over the last few years in, in terms of asset deployment was to convert our, our last BLS unit. We had one unit left that was uh, all EMT trained, no paramedics on it. So, so if they needed, if they were closest to a call and, they, and it was an advanced life support call, they had to be supported by another unit. So we've, we've trained two paramedics on there. They, they have the equipment to run uh, advanced life support calls now. And so now you're only sending one unit on that call, not having to pull another unit out of service, um, quicker response times there. Um, occupying our first dues. The first due of a fire station, and I've got to explain this because YDL told me I did. The first due in a fire station uh, is, is the area around that station that the unit from that station is most likely to get to the quickest. So that's their first due. That's what we talk about when, we, when, it's, when we're saying first dues. So we try to keep our units in our first dues. A few ways that we try to do that. We try to extend as much training as we possibly can through our target solution software in the stations so they can train, receive classes in the stations while they're in service, available, ready to run calls, as opposed to pulling them down to our training center out of service um, to, uh, for, for trainings. 
Um, if we have a fleet that, that is in good condition, we don't have we don't have the breakdowns. And, and you know the obvious is if you break down the way to a call, it's right. It's, it takes longer, but but it's a lot more than that. It's when when you have a robust preventative maintenance program like we do, and you have a, a fleet that's in the condition we do, you don't have to go down to the shop and change it out, move into a backup unit. That entire time you're out of service before you get back into your first due area. Um, we have a we have a fleet that's in good shape and a, and a good program for that. Our backup units are now stocked to the point where a changeover into a backup unit takes about 10 minutes. Several years ago, it took an hour. Those are those are all things that we try to do for response times. Uh, one of um, one of the things that we also do is um, our, our our IGA partners, the other cities that are that are part of the automatic aid consortium in the valley. Those 27 cities. If we were to have a big call in, in the city of Tempe and, and, and our stations were to empty out and they were all on this call, it automatically starts looking for those kinds of holes in the system so that they will start to backfill, pull trucks from other cities to fill our, our stations during the, during the uh, duration of that call. They look for that all over the valley so that we don't have holes in, in service anywhere. Some of the things we do to occupy the, the first dues. Um, we're very, very fortunate in the city of Tempe to, uh, to have departments that that strive to and, and do understand the challenges that, that we all face. And I think we all try to support each other. We get a ton of support from our partners within the city, the different, uh, the different departments within the city, understanding what our response needs are and, and, and some supporting us. Um, we try to look for things in the city that are gonna change that might affect our response time. We have people in the rest of the city who come to, come to us when those things happen. When, when we um, started talking about putting bollards in downtown Tempe, People came to us and said, you guys need to be involved with this. This could, re this could affect your response times. Some of the support we get, a couple of bulleted items on that. That's why Dave Cash will come to the fire station at 3 o'clock in the morning and work on our, elect on our electrical. So we're not having to manually open those huge doors and put them down, costing us seconds in our response times. Uh, streets, when they put in traffic calming measures in, in neighborhoods, they take time to, to, to design them and implement them in such a way that it doesn't slow down our response. Uh, they make it a priority to go out and fix any malfunctioning uh, preemption system. Preemption is, is that system that turns our street light to red while the other in the, others in inter intersection get turned to, to, turns ours to green, turns the other ones to red so that we can go through more quickly. So they, they make that a priority. We just had a meeting with uh, community development a couple weeks ago. Um, where's Chad? You can see him here today. Where, where, we were trying, where they, uh, they were trying to understand our needs for access and new developments, and those, those kinds of things. CARE 7, um, the... Unique capabilities that they have um, releases us from calls, so we can go back into service. Before they were here, it was one of the. It, there were a lot of needs that were not being met um, for our customers, and and we would try our best to do it, but we weren't really trained to do those things for them. They come in, they have that high skill level. We leave the call, we go back into service to to run the things that uh, that we're able to run. Um, so, strategies moving forward. We're going, to take, we're going to try to take advantage of technology any place we can. Uh, we are the pilot program through the Phoenix Dispatch System for a, pro, for a program called Wheels Moving Time. This is where they're using GPS to track when the truck actually starts moving from the station, taking out that human error element that we talked about a little while ago with pushing the button. We know exactly when that, that truck starts to move. They've been working through the data for us for six, eight months now. They're, they're actually starting to use it a little bit in Phoenix, but we're the pilot program for it. We're going to start to get that information soon. So, so more accurate information. We're going to continue to take advantage of uh, station, station location studies, response studies, asset deployment studies. That company that did the original station location study for us has since done about a half a dozen more. Um, we're going to continue to do that. IT is currently working on some dashboards for us where we can get real-time information on, on response times. We can manipulate it and see exactly what we want to see, a certain truck, a certain station, a certain area. Um, so that's what we're going to try to take advantage from in, in terms of strategy for technology. Uh, continue to make sure our resources are correct. As we mentioned, Station 7 is going in, into service in, uh, in southeast Tempe. That will probably happen sometime mid-year next year. Uh, and we've had several discussions about, about a station in, in northeast Tempe already. Um, we, have to be able to, we have to be open to new deployment ideas. Last year at this time, we ran a pilot study for a two-person low-acuity unit, low-acuity meaning lower-level um, lower level emergent care. Uh, we're talking, if you think about BLS calls and some other things, our, our standard response is a four person higher acuity unit that's able to respond to all, call, all calls. As a result of that pilot, the pilot was a success. We believe that the time is right now and the call volume is correct, that we can take a four person unit out of station, our station two 
and we can move it into Station 7 when it opens, as opposed to putting a whole new unit there. We can replace that unit with that two-person low acuity unit that'll work beside the four-person unit that's still there. So we have to be willing to try those, um, those, those different deployment models. And we will continue to um, look at alternative response. Uh, our, our patient advocate services program uh, started out uh, by cold calling people that were frequent users of 911 and uh, knocking on the door and seeing if they could figure out and, and help them towards the proper medical care. If you're calling 911 um, 15 times a month, you're probably not getting the proper medical care. They've been extremely successful in, in helping people maneuver through the healthcare system to get the right health care and have really taken a lot of that chronic use off. They've become proactive in some other things, veterans um, telemedicine program where, where they will go into homes of veterans and get them a, an, a, an appointment um, from their home using a computer to talk back to the doctor at the VA and they can get those appointments months ahead of time. And, and what they've been able to do is, is to uh, prevent people from becoming 911 users to begin with. So, um, and then there's our ALS AMBO or ALS ambulance uh, program that we're doing too. It's helping us to get our units back in service a little more quickly. So, challenges moving forward. Um, that call volume we talked about, um, growth in the city. The, the city is growing, not just that it's growing, but the way it's growing and we're becoming more dense. And of course, that same, um, that same challenge we all have as we're all trying to continue to provide the service we provide at the level we do and maybe improve it a little bit in, in the budget. So that is, that is my program. So, Aaron, I went a little over 10 minutes. And I will. So this is what I love about this uh, strategic management office uh, with Rosa and Aaron and Wydale. They partner with the organizations and they take on uh, performance measures that aren't all within their control. It would be easy to focus and say, we're going to have a turnout of time of this. That's our performance measure. And that would be great, but we consider that, Aaron, an input. That's not the outcome we're looking for. So we as an organization are looking for outcomes. And we understand that you can train and you can build fire stations and you can equip and you can do all of those things, but the road conditions and the traffic and uh, your partners in automatic aid and all of those things are going to impact whether or not you can achieve your performance measure that you've established. And that's the beauty of this. This is a team effort, this is an organization. So uh, if you could uh, give Craig some input on where you think they might be able to do better or help them accelerate this or, or just ask him questions about all of that good information he just gave us. I, I have a feeling Craig could talk for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Not really. That's all I had. But Go ahead, Craig. You I will take... answer questions, and I might get some help from my uh, my gallery of uh, oh, no, no. white shirts. No help. Of you're all up. you're up. All in, you're on up here. I'm an intern with the strategic management uh, program here. Uh, do you have a sense um, of those 25 percent that miss the mark? Uh, how much you would have to shave off on average to get to uh, to get to 90 percent? Um, and and then two part uh, second part there. Uh, what are the common attributes of those calls that that miss the the six minute mark? Yeah, actually, this is actually this is Andrea Glass. She's our interim uh, assistant chief in charge of community risk, but she also spent a lot of time in our medical services area, and so she's chomping at the bit. So I'm gonna yeah, let her reason, go. Yeah, the reason come why. On, so come, you have to come up to the mic. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, so we recently just submitted the information for accreditation. We did our annual compliance report, and one of it is that 90th percentile for um, ALS calls. And actually, we're about seven seconds off of that six-minute. Six oh, that was bad. Six-minute marker. Um, so last year, we were in 2016. We we're at seven minutes, 31 seconds for total response time. This year, we were at six minutes and seven seconds in the 90th percentile. So we're already making significant strides towards that. We're only about seven seconds off. So, um, in looking at it, places that we can shave off time would be our actual. Um, Turnout time would be a, a good area for us to be able to shave some time off to reach that 90th percentile. Call processing time um, increased or improved by about 10 seconds from 2016 to 2017 with automated voice and everything else like that. But um, the place that we really can shave off the time is our turnout time. There you go. Super. Other comments and questions? <clears throat> Uh, hello, my name is uh, Merrill Darcy. I'm representing the Riverside Neighborhood Association, which is just west of Mill Avenue. My concern and our concern is that maybe with the demise of Station 2, that we seem to be separated by a lot of Union Pacific Railroad grade crossings. 
And I was wondering if the, if uh, we were all wondering if the city of Tempe has any preemptive devices with your technology to alert any oncoming trains, which could be as much as 20 to a 40 minute wait on any of the university, 5th Street, and I believe 9th Street and, and 13th Street before the hospital and sometimes even Broadway. So I like a, a comment on the, on the railroad for uh, implementing that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we don't have technology that will preempt the railroad. The railroad is going to keep moving. But um, we do have the opportunity to call them and, and have them stop if we're on the railroad, those kinds of things. But in terms of our response times, we don't. But we do communicate when, when, when we're slowed. Our response is slowed by, by, um, by a, a train coming through over, over a street. Um, we do communicate, and, and we'll get a second unit dispatch from another area to start going that direction. Um, the, the information that we do currently have on Station 2, when, um, when, when we make the replacement, they're still going to have some of the faster response times within the city, which is, which is why we felt like it was, it was um, the right thing to do. We wouldn't have that opportunity because a station two would be out, and that would be our only choice for any response time west of that area. Whereas the the station one on Ash wouldn't be able to uh, to service any of the properties there because of the railroad. This is a big concern that we have. It's it's happened a few times already during storms. So I, under I understand your question a little bit better. Station two that we want to keep running. Right. Station two is not going to stop running. It it is it is scheduled to be rebuilt, but it, it is going to continue to run through the rebuild process, and then, um, and then it's, going to, it's going to continue to, to be a station in that area um, as, as we move forward. We haven't decided exactly where it's going to go, but, but most likely it's going to go right in the same place. Uh, if, if it's not in the same place, it has to be right in that, in that general vicinity. That's yes, that's not stopping. Yes, thank you. Thank you. If I could just take this yeah, opportunity. Uh, I didn't mention earlier that we videotape these and we Put them on channel 11 so if you have questions uh people out watching in, on tv feel free to call the fire staff or city manager staff and we'll try to get you in touch with the right person uh regarding any of these uh sessions but and we also urge you to come down and there's a schedule that is online that tells you when all of these presentations are and i'll tell you now the next one is december 13th and i'll repeat that later but thank you for members of the public showing up well Looks like you're off the hook. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give my hand. Well, we have one other presentation, and it has to be that was uh, more of an objective measure where we're measuring time, and it seems pretty concrete. But we also have uh, more uh, measurements that uh, relate to citizen satisfaction, which this one is. And Martha is going to present that to you. Uh, Martha, if you want to describe your performance measure and begin. What do I do? Just okay, great. All right, um, Martha Garner. I am with Community Relations and Media, Communication Media Relations. I'm one of the webmasters along with Michelle Guerreri. I'm Chris Foster Dean, and I'm a public information officer for the city of Tempe. Okay, we are going to go over today um, the city's website, Tempe.gov. I'm going to go over a couple things. Uh, we're always available 24 7. The, city, the website is up. Uh, we strive to answer most questions, um, saves both um, staff and community time. On the website, we tell our story through photos, events, news, and our brand. Our performance measure is 2.4. Uh, achieve ratings, okay. achieve ratings of very satisfied or satisfied with the quality of city website greater than or equal to the national benchmark cities as measured in the community survey. The baseline is 68.4, and our target is to be among the nation's top 10%. The website is the number one way to get information, um, and we found that out through the 2018 uh, resident survey. The website is the hub for city information. All roads lead to our website. Uh, top way people can engage with the city, they go on there to pay bills, find events, find out when their trash pickup days are. 
register for classes, they go to the city site to get information or to do a task. Uh, the user experience, people need to be able to get on there quickly and get the information or complete their task quickly. Um, helps us save ta staff time and money. People are not calling into the city, um, taking up staff time. Saves our community time and money and helps us make sales like our, our commercial re um, recycling and golf program. Oops, there we go. Um, our, our city website supports all of the city measures. We cross over all of them. So good enough is not good enough. We are exceeding the national average as we are looking to be in the top 10% of our country. Website redesign is currently underway and we will be launching later this month. On our new website, we have uh, enhanced features. Um, we have a large search bar. We have some new, um, new features. Uh, we're going to be putting the um, Tempe 11 um, videos on our homepage and we're also incorporating our brand into the new website. So the City of Tempe website, um, as Martha said before, it's the number one way people get information about our community. But on top of that, it's the number one way they get really specific information about our community. They go online, most of the time what they do to reach us is they Google us, and they'll type in, how do I sign up for recreation classes? And Google will bring up the Tempe recreation page. Um, and so they can go in right away, sign up for that class, get everything they need and go away and not ever have to walk in our door. They don't have to worry about leaving work early. They don't have to worry about, do I have to go somewhere to pay this? Everything's available to them online right then and there. They can do it at midnight. They can do it at six in the morning. It's much more convenient for everyone. Our top users, according to Google Analytics, come from Tempe and Phoenix and that, you know, that is a wonderful thing to know. We know that a lot of that is coming in from people utilizing those services. Um, Tempe is in the center of the valley, so we do draw from the entire valley, people looking for things to do here. Um, about half of our visitors were on mobile phones, like probably all of you are right now. Um, <laughs> and um, it's really interesting because, for instance, community development, they have a lot of developers and they're doing their work at work on a desktop. 85% of the visitors to that particular section of web pages are visiting from a desktop. But if you are community services, chances are you're going in there on your mobile phone. We have stories of people seeing somebody outside the library or the museum standing there with their mobile phone doing this, and then they look up and go, oh, I'm here, and they walk in the door. Um, our most visited web pages are the library, um, Qantas Recreation Center, and jobs. These are pages where you can do things. These are things where you can find exact information. People want to be able to apply for that job. They want to be able to check out that book. And they want to know when the wave pool is open. Um, our data, the data we get from Google Analytics, really mirrors carefully our population. If you look over there, you'll see the biggest portion of our population is 25 to 34 year olds. It's the same for our website. Um, that cross, the, that, that circle that you see, the pie chart, it's very similar to what you would go to and see on the census. And then finding Tempe.gov, once again, you'll see Google, you know, that organic search being the number one way. But surprisingly, the next most popular thing that people are seeing they're typing in the web address exactly. They're typing in tempe.gov slash fire. They're typing in tempe-gov slash library. They've either seen it on something that they've received, they've bookmarked it, or in some way they just know what our website is. They're typing it in directly. 27%, that's a huge number. Um, and that is, you know, very much a product of the marketing and promotions that we do, but also the internal promotions that you are all doing in your facilities. Um, I hate to go to the, next one. the challenges of the website, it's just the vast majority of the, the different programs. We have uh, the different departments, but within departments we have a variety of divisions, uh, programs. 
So there's a lot to cover um, in, on the website. Um, we have thousands of pages. Um, this will be, we've moved over the, the old site. We're currently working on our new site. We've reduced the number of pages, but we still have thousands of pages. And so one of the challenges is keeping all of those pages up to date. Um, things constantly change. And the, the information that changes, um, the events, the news items and meetings, things change hourly on our site. Um, and we serve all kinds of visitors from recreation to developers. Um, they all have different needs. So that's a, a different challenge that we have, making sure we, we provide all those um, needs to everyone that's coming to our site and providing um, equal experiences for everyone, um, including those who are not seeing our site but hearing our site. So making sure that we're compliant with the ADA. So our strategies. We are currently um, giving enhanced Webster trainings. Those are in the works. I think we have a few more next or this month. Um, we also have content search and branding training that, that, is, that happens after the Webster training. Um, we have a new style guide, so that helps the uh, Websters uh, help write correctly for the web so that they are within our brand, our new city brand. We do have a new, uh, we're, we're implementing the approval process. So we had hundreds of Websters we, over time, we've reached out to each department. They've helped us identify who in their group would be a, a good Webster to keep up with these pages. Um, so we've narrowed the, um, or we've limited the number of Websters we currently have. Um, and so we've divided them into two groups. We have um, publishers and editors. So editors can go onto the web pages, make changes, create new page new pages, but they will not be published for the public until the publisher approves it. So um, that's helping us uh, keep everything updated. Um, we are also putting in a six-month reminder on every page that's published. In six months, the um, editor will receive an email that you need to look at your page. It's been six months and make sure all the information is correct. Uh, we are also adding a new page reader. So someone who is coming to our site that's not seeing our site, the site could be read to them. Um, so we're, we're, putting, we're implementing that on our new website. Um, we'll get regular software um, improvements and updates. Those usually come in monthly. And uh, future, looking to the future, we will be um, adding MailChimp, the email marketing program to our system. And that is it. Thank you. So uh, to summarize, the if we look at the top 10% of the cities in the country, they get about 71% satisfied or very, very satisfied customers in terms of their website. So that's a pretty lofty goal, um, um, comparing ourselves to the top 10% in the country. So <laughs> we can do it. Yeah. That's what I like. We can do it. So, so high. comments and suggestions? We did bring some extra copies of the Tempe Style Guide. It's, uh, it's available for everyone. And really, the primary reason we created that is because we want to make sure that our website has a really comprehensive look. We don't want it to look like there's 20 or 30 websites within our website. We want it to look like one city of Tempe website. So by everybody using the same style for AMs and PMs and street addresses and times and days, it really does pro help provide that professional, cohesive look to the website. And we greatly appreciate everybody moving toward that. No question. So while you're thinking of a question, I have a question. Um, we've made a lot of improvements recently. What is the trend on the improvement over the last several years? We've been, we've been doing citizen satisfaction surveys since 2007. What has been the trend in satisfaction with our website? Well, I believe this um, this one that just came out yesterday, it was the first time that it surpassed uh, the newsletter that comes out in the water bill. Surpassed. The website. We've always been second. It's the number one. And way the citizen satisfaction with the website, that's where we're getting our score, 
Is it, has it been getting better? It's been, I assume it's been getting better, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so we're trending upward yeah. towards our goal. And I think a really good answer to that question is, everything digital is going up. Um, the number of people who are using our website has significantly increased. The number of people who use that to get information about the city has now become the number one way that they get information. Our social media numbers have gone up by seven points in the last year. So that's 7% more people are using that as one of the best ways to get information about our city. And as time changes, print materials continue to scale down and digital materials continue to scale up. So kind of a double-edged sword because uh, people are becoming more and more dependent on this, this vehicle to get their information. So as they become more dependent on it, they might become less satisfied if we don't keep up with improvements. Right. So, we, so another example of we could have had a performance measure that said we're going to measure the number of people who use our website and it's going to go up, which wouldn't have given us much indication about whether people are satisfied with it. So instead, we've chosen to measure how satisfied people are with it. And another thing to think about is the sheer number of people who are from Tempe who are using our website. So really, also, part of that is dependent on the number of residents we have. Right. So the number alone would not necessarily be enough. But as our workforce grows and the number of visitors we have continue to grow, the number of visits to the website also goes up. Sure. And we just need to get them all satisfied. So, so let's hear your comments about a bad experience with the website so, so that they can hear it. Let's, <laughs> what's, what's your most frustrating? None. <laughs> Break the ice. The planning department. Is, is probably the most difficult to navigate, I would think. Um, uh, from my experience and other, you know, either going through the, uh, trying to get to the design review, just trying to get to what project is on there, because we, a lot of us in a really dense area can't rely on the, on the 300 foot signs anymore, is that we have to go on the website in order to see what the new project is around the corner. And even though it's beyond the 300 foot level, we have no idea that this is even coming on. So we have to either go to the planning department and find out exactly what's happening on this property. So that, that's a big, uh, I, we feel a lot of, uh, with uh, me and Philip Yates and a few other people, we've had difficulty on that with the, with the uh, develop, with, uh, development review and also the uh, planning department. So. Yes. You are going to be so happy in a couple of months. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, you know, because it's, a, it's actually a, a well-used and utilized site. A lot of uh, residents uh, use that site because we can't rely on the 300-foot limit with the, with the red signs, the zoning changes or any type of development changes or, or you know, public hearings. So we need to have a, a little bit more uh, exposure to that on the website bit about what we're going to be doing. First of all, about 36,000 people a year use the community development website, or rather not necessarily the number of people, but that's the number of times that that site is visited, 36,000 times. We are in the process right now of completely redoing the navigation for that website and setting it up so there are larger buttons that you can click. All the maps are going to be on one page. I think it's going to be a lot easier for you to find that information when we're done restructuring that section. And if it's not, you can email me and we'll talk about it. Right, so. because the trend now is, which we're teaching in our classes to the Websters, is to have people go to the site to do a task or to find information. So we're, we're training, retraining now that on the top of the page, because people see about it the first third, is to put buttons that will link down to the information that the end user is actually looking for. So you're not having to scroll or try and find the navigation to what you want to find out. So we've been, we've been going over that in class, um, putting buttons on the top third of the page to take you directly to the information. And the other thing that we've been working on is um, some of our website is pretty text heavy. And so we've been talking to people about maybe writing that a little bit shorter. The content training that we're doing really does help them figure out how can I do this in a way that will eliminate some of the words, get people directly to what they need, and make that happen faster. So, like I said, community development is in the middle of reorganizing their section of the website. And it's probably going to take a couple of months, but um, you know, you'll need to go online and look at that GIS map that we have, though, because that's really great. You can look right at what's happening exactly as pin in your neighborhood. 
Other other questions or suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. Send us your ideas and suggestions to Tempe Accelerates at Tempe.gov and visit us at Tempe.gov slash Tempe Accelerate.